Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice today because it was sunny. Let's face it, we could rejoice yesterday even though it wasn't the same. I'm Pastor Wayne Chevy. I serve as campus pastor at Wisconsin Lutheran College in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it is my privilege to share God's Word with you today as we continue our Lenten series, Our Greatest Needs. And today we're reminded that even in the the tragedy of death, that we have the gift of life through Christ our Savior. And so um, today we will have that as our focus. Um, I just learned that we're going to have some singers today um, in place of the psalm, so I'm pretty jacked up. <laughs> I pray that uh, you enjoy your worship. If you're, if you're visiting today, the order of service will be on the screens for you. It'll also be in the service folder as you came in today. We'll begin with our opening hymn, hymn 868, By Faith. Come, let us worship the Lord.
For all who are able, please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. And in the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally inherit eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our greatest needs, life in death. Our lessons today focus on the confidence that we can have that even at the, our most desperate times that our God cares for us, loves us, and gives us hope. Uh, maybe not always in our physical lives, but certainly in our eternal life. Today in our first lesson, we see God's power in action as he shows his strength over the power of death by reviving the son of the Shunammite woman. From 2 Kings chapter 4. But the woman became pregnant in the next year about that same time she gave birth to a son just as Elisha had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out with his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, My head, my head. His father told his servant, Carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. She set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run to her, meet her, and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. 
Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you? Don't raise my hopes. Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take your staff into your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet, and if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound of response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy is not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out him, on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. And he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. This is the word of the Lord. At this time, the children are invited to come forward to sing the anthem. The thought of death brings fear, but as the Apostle Paul lays out for us, death is just temporary and the eternal life belongs to us. And the gift that we receive is to be called children of God and to live forever 
with Him in heaven. Our second lesson is from Romans chapter 8. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. This too is the word of the Lord. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. We continue with our hymn of the day, hymn number 19. We sing the selected verses.
Please stand for the works and words of our Savior. God's word for our consideration today is from John chapter 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, shortly after the United States became a nation, one of our great statesman, Benjamin Franklin, already pieced things together pretty quickly. Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. There is no permanency except for death and taxes, and yet it seems like those are here to stay. As we are approaching April, I'm guessing some of you may have already prepared your things. Maybe some of you have already gotten your return. Maybe some of you are paying even more. Well, death is on a timeline as well. And you haven't, quote unquote, cashed in on it, but no doubt you have already, you already know somebody who has. And so that changes our minds and changes our hearts and changes our spirit. The permanency of death is there. And and that's why in the second lesson I talked about how so often we fear it. Except for the fact that we don't have to be afraid because we know from Scripture that our physical death is not permanent. We do all have a time of grace. It starts at our conception, comes to fruition when We are born, and then all of us have different timelines. Hours, days, months, years. Maybe some of us even hit the century mark. 
we see God's grace in action, and it doesn't have a specific timetable for any one of us. And so we live and have our being. We, we grow up. We go to work. We pay the permanency of taxes. And then eventually we will draw our last breath. But as God's people, we don't view that death in the same way as the world. We see it as going on to an eternal life that is a gift of ours. It was interesting as I was studying the three lessons that we read today, got to pick the one that, that I wanted, I couldn't help but think of these, the words of our gospel lesson and how they kind of started a tongue twister in my own mind and what that means. And, and when I developed that theme, I think it's appropriate for us to, to focus on all three of the natural words, right? The unnatural becomes natural, which leads to the supernatural. When God created the world in, seven, in six days and rested on the seventh, as we read in Genesis 1, we see the unique perfection that only those first two chapters of our Bible knew. We saw God putting everything into motion for our lives, and then we saw him create the animals, and then the crown of his creation, mankind. And yet, as awesome and as perfect as it was, Adam still recognized that the beautiful animals that were around him were not like him. There was no one to converse. There was no one to have an intimate relationship with. As cool as the stripes were of the zebra, they couldn't have a conversation. As long and as cool as the neck of the giraffe was, they weren't the same. And it's comforting maybe as the animals that we have, like we love our cat or our dog, it wasn't the same as having the interpersonal relationship that Adam was seeking. And so while he was sleeping, God created a woman for him and the bond of marriage and of family life was established. We don't know how many days it was intact, but we learn in Genesis chapter 3, as we, as we heard a few weeks ago in that first Sunday of Lent, it did not last long. The deception of Satan caused the questioning and then ultimately the sin of Adam and Eve. So the question then becomes, what is the natural? Well, what is natural is perfection, sinlessness, the holiness. The man and woman were naked, but they felt no shame because sin hadn't entered the world. When God established the world, that was the natural thing. But when we look at our gospel lesson, we see what is unnatural. You see, because in a perfect world, there is no death. People, animals, plants, they all live forever. And we could get into the, the ramifications if we just kept reproducing of, of where we would be and how full the earth would be and all of those things. But the reality is God had a plan that people would live in a perfect, harmonious relationship with him. But once sin came into the world, everything changed. There was going to be friction now between the husband and the wife. There was going to be pain in childbirth and, and hard labor for all those who put in their time. And the biggest curse was death. Adam and Eve are not going to live forever. And because we are children of Adam and Eve, we live in a world where we know that we are not going to live forever. And so the natural led to the un or the un the, the natural is unnatural. And so we needed a Savior who came into the world to change everything. And that was revealed to us in Genesis chapter 3 as well. And so you go from Genesis chapter 3 to John 11, and you see what takes place in the unnatural. The fact that there is death. And sadly now that unnatural becomes our second nature. I don't know how many of you still read the obituaries. A lot of us don't even read the newspaper. But we 
hear every, every day that people don't live forever. And so we might shrug our shoulders as, as Benjamin Franklin did and say, well, now there's this permanency and this is just going to keep happening. And it's sad that we have to look at it as this being our natural occurrence. But what takes place for us through the power of Jesus is a reminder that we don't have to live in that state of despondency. That we don't live without hope, but there is hope that is there. Jesus comes to Bethany after Lazarus has been dead for four days, and both sisters are able to profess to him, we know that if you would have been here, things could have been different. Physically, you could have allowed everything to turn out different. The friends who are gathered around with Mary and Martha, the professional mourners as they're known, going through seven days of crying and wailing about what had taken place, they would not have had to assemble. Whatever was ailing Lazarus could have been prevented and fixed. And so if they tell Jesus, if he had been here, our brother would not have died. But we shouldn't be surprised that God had everything in place and calculated appropriately. Yes, Jesus may have taken his time, but it was so that he could lead people to see the supernatural. That he would reveal his power before their very eyes. But what's interesting is even when he got there, he waited. And we have this very interesting commentary and this very interesting description of what Jesus did. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then we are told that Jesus wept. And then a second time, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. You see, Jesus understood the ramifications of the very first sin, and it was right there in front of him. And people were sad, and they were grieving. It was unnatural, but it had become so natural. And the reason Jesus came into the world was to restore the beauty of perfection. The beauty of holiness. No, not in this world, but to assure people that there was something that was going to take place before their very eyes then, but in a short time after, after he was going to be nailed to a cross, that he would burst the chains of death. He would crush Satan, and he would grant eternal life to his people. That there was no reason to live in fear, but instead to rejoice and to celebrate. Now, we don't have all the conversation. We're told that some of those Jewish people who had assembled to mourn, well, they believed. And I'm guessing there was some rejoicing. Um, But I don't know about you, but I'd always be curious to learn a little bit more if God would have revealed it to us. Um, What was Lazarus' reaction? He was a believer. He relied on the promises of God, which meant that if he was dead for four days he would have been having the celebration that everybody was anticipating. And unfortunately, he didn't give, we don't have the vivid descriptions. We don't have the interactions and for him to, to describe what we can anticipate. In some regards, I'm guessing Lazarus was like, why? We ask the question, why when somebody passes away in an untimely, fa- in an untimely fashion? Or after seeing somebody who has been ill for a long time, why, Lord, why did you allow this to happen? I'm guessing Lazarus was like, why, Lord? Why did you allow this to happen? Why am I back here? Because I know there's going to be more sadness and more trial, temptations that I'm going to fail in, all of these things that are lost, and I know I'm going to die again. We don't have that revealed to us because that isn't the goal of why Jesus came into the world. The goal was to show his supernatural power over death, and in this moment, he did that. 
but even Jesus understood the gravity of the situation and how sin affects every single one of us. He's deeply moved. He weeps. Yeah, I'm guessing the thought was the loss of my friend Lazarus, but he knew what he was going to do. It was the fact that sin was going to affect all mankind, and he had seen it for nearly 33 years already, and he was going to see it for some time after this. And even after he came back to life from the dead, he was still going to have one of his own doubt that he was alive. That there were still going to be those people who made up stories about him and didn't believe in, in, in him as a savior. Dear friends, when we come into God's word, not just in worship but in our own personal Bible study, we're coming into that closer relationship so that the tears that we, that we shed aren't ones that last forever. We have emotions, and one of the natural emotions is sadness at a loss. And yet we don't just gravitate and hold on to the loss. My prayer is that we can move forward boldly and thankfully, that we have people around us who are full of compassion, who strengthen one another, who build each other up, who continue to foster that community and within the, belie- within the family of believers, it is so valuable to continue to rally around each other. We'll have a prayer shortly for one of our sisters in Christ, knowing that all of us are going to the throne of glory, seeking God's will to be carried out. And knowing that those prayers maybe are not always answered exactly the way we want, but that God has everything in control and he allows us to see his power, his majesty, and the beauty of his wisdom in all of life's circumstances. Jesus wept, and at times we will too. But we are not just left with the sad eyes and the broken heart. No, because we are assured that we will be a part of the supernatural. That when we draw our last breath, barring Jesus coming in glory before that time, that we know in that instant we'll be in the presence of God. That we will see with our own eyes the Savior who has won the victory for us, who conquered all of our greatest enemies and granted us the victory and the crown of eternal life. That all belongs to you and to me. And it's a time where Jesus returns us to what was originally planned, the natural perfect sinless place that we all yearn for. Those streets of gold will sing Jerusalem the Golden to wrap up our service, to be reminded that this is a place where all of our tears will be dried and that there will be only joy and thanksgiving. The opportunity to sing those praises unendingly with the chorus of believers who have gone before us all the way back to Adam and Eve all the way till the end of time that we have a place that is being prepared for us and that we get to see the supernatural. Right now we are living our eternal life but we can't see it because we're still in this world. And so we, we, we study and we work and we serve one another with thanksgiving and gladness because our sins have been conquered and we don't have to be afraid. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And we look forward to the blessings of that gift. Just like in 2023, in 2024, there will be taxes to be paid. And we don't know what our timeline looks like if, if today will be our last day or if we have many more days and years to come. But what we do know is that Jesus has changed our perspective on everything. That the unnatural fact that death isn't for us and that we have to live with what is perceived as natural to us will be no more. Because we have seen Jesus and he leads us to the cross and he leads us to the empty tomb and he leads us to the glory of heaven. 
and we grasp and we hold on to the supernatural that is yet to come. For that we offer our thanks and praise. Just as our children sang, Jesus for us, all of those things that he's done for us have come to fulfillment and they are ours. Thank you, Jesus, for being for us. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Having heard God's word, let's join our hearts and voices with believers of the past and of the present. We join together today in confessing that faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we've had our opportunity to offer our thanks through our offerings. At this time, they'll be brought forward to the altar. At this time, on behalf of our friend Terry Framery, we offer a prayer that God would guide the surgeons who, are, who will be tending to her this week. Terry will be undergoing open heart surgery on March 31st. Let us pray. Merciful Lord and Savior, you've promised to be with your believers everywhere and in all circumstances of life. May the assurance of your abiding presence and loving care, comfort, and sustain your servant, Terry as she faces and undergoes surgery. Remove all anxiety and fear from her heart and lead her to rest all of her confidence in you. Bless the work of the surgeon and give success to the surgery as it pleases you. Be with Terry and her loved ones as she recovers and fill them all with an abiding thankfulness for all of your blessings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And please stand. We join together in the responsive prayer of the church. Let us pray. O triune God, you have done everything for our lives here and hereafter. For your presence and power, we thank you with all of our being. You continually lift us up when we fall and guide us in the path we are to follow. For your unending love, we praise you. As we confront the sting of death in our lives, comfort us with the fact that death is not the end, but only a sleep. Jesus Christ has conquered death with his almighty work. Your true words give us hope and healing as we see the ultimate effect of sin in this world. Comfort us in our trials and calm our grieving hearts. Remind us of our eternal life with you and all who believe in Christ. Lord Jesus, send the Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we might have the courage to tell others of your victory over death. Use us to reach the world for you. Open the eyes and hearts of many to believe. And now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. You, Christ, are the resurrection and the life. 
knowing you answer all our prayers, we join the prayer you taught us, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with the singing of Jerusalem the Golden. Please stand and let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. 
Once again, a special good morning to all of you, especially want to welcome our guests and our visitors. I'm anticipating that some of you are visiting uh, Messiah along with your children who are singing. If you are here maybe for the very first time, I would encourage you to come back next week and hear the real pastor. Um, but it's been my, it's been my privilege uh, to, to be here uh, with you. I have to admit now, the children, I'm going to start with them, uh, absolutely terrific. Let's give them a round of applause. So uh, formality is not my strong suit, okay? So the fact that they stood there that still for that long was terrific. The singing was on point. Um, I'm a clapper, so I'm proud of everybody who held off because I didn't want to at the time. Um, and also, all of you who are so reserved and didn't, I didn't see a bunch of cameras up. Like, I wanted to get my camera up, and then I'm like, nobody else does. So, you know, um, uh, j just a beautiful reminder of who Jesus is for us and I would say, um, I, I, my organist today, uh, she can attest to the fact that my sermon got a little bit modified in, in service number two, and it got a little shorter because there were a lot of small people in here, and I thought I'd be merciful. <laughs> um, it, but, well, but, but what I tied in, in in the first service in the sermon was, you know, they talked about some who believed. And let's face it, we're in a hurting world, and not everybody has the same confidence that we have. So the next couple of weeks are great opportunities to invite individuals to come and hear of the confidence that we have, to celebrate it, and to see something that's supernatural, to, to be comforted with that um, eternal life. Next week, we've got, uh, on, on Palm Sunday, um, we're, we're bringing something back that we haven't seen in a while. We're going to have a children's devotion, so I'm guessing we'll be waving palms, and uh, Pastor Schultz, you're going to have... Are you going to have something awesome to, uh, as part of that? See, now, here's the thing. The problem with doing the children's sermon is that's what the adults always remember. All right? So try to focus on the actual sermon next week when, when we get to that point. Um, there's obviously a bunch of other uh, things. If you haven't picked up your, your blue sheet, it's got um, the special Holy Week services along with the uh, family Easter uh, and egg hunt. Uh, which takes place on the Saturday, on Saturday the 8th, invite the people. One thing I also noted um, was the sign out there in the back, who are you inviting? I know there's not a lot of stickers on there right now, but maybe right now in your heart, you got somebody who's, all right, here's the person I'm going to invite because they need a little comfort and a little confidence, and Jesus is the one who is able to offer that as he come here to Messiah. Um, I have a letter, a, a letter to read. Um, dated March 21st. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, after prayerful deliberation, I've decided to return the divine call to serve with you at Messiah Lutheran in Green Bay. It's clear that the Lord has presented you with beautiful, with beautiful ministry opportunities and a Christ-like zeal to go about his work. Your thoughtfulness, wise planning, and love for both finding the lost and equipping the saints was clear as well. I give thanks to God for the way our Savior is blessing you and guiding your work. As I counseled with your leaders and with ours, it became equally clear that this would be a particularly difficult time to leave ministry in Marietta. The Lord currently has us wrapping up a capital project of our own and preparing to launch a new mission congregation in the next few months. It's an exciting but from an earthly perspective fragile time for our ministry here and after counsel with our congregation, I'm convinced God's kingdom is better served for my staying than my leaving. Please know that your ministry and efforts will continue to have a place in my prayers, together with the confidence that the Lord will bring you the right shepherd in his good timing. Your prayers for our work here are appreciated as well. God's grace and peace be with you. Yours in Christ, Pastor Joel Seifert. And so with that, um, obviously, there will be an opportunity after Easter uh, to uh, issue a, another call and opportunity. Um, I apologize, I can't stop talking. Um, uh, on, the, on the back half of that, so um, my parents, my, my grandmother is originally from Coleman, and so my parents have had a cabin up in that area forever. This is honestly the first time I ever veered this way rather than going over the bridge in my 51 years of life. So, 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 I bet, so as I was, I was coming here today, I, I bent to the right towards Door County rather than going left towards the mainland. I don't know if that's a real term, but uh, <laughs> towards the mainland. And obviously, 
the reason why we're calling a second pass there is because as I come this way, all of the homes that are newer, the opportunities that are, uh, that are out here, um, I pray that the Lord provide that uh, additional shepherd for you to continue to go under God's grace. Um, obviously, exciting times and exciting opportunities for all of you. Um, why am I here? Because your pastor is here. Um, some of you might know that there was a little event last night that uh, Pastor and, and Jill host, and I've been, had the privilege of being the MC for that event for the last several years, and I know the amount of time and effort that goes into it. I said, I'm already here. Take the day off. And you know what the guy's doing? He's texting me at 6.15 to make sure I show up. <laughs> and then after, the, then after the first service, which I think came off pretty well, then he's telling me what to do in the second service. I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity. It's been my pleasure to be with you. I'm going to go down the end of the aisle. Please let all those small people up as soon as possible. Thanks. Thanks.